It's so great to be here. Um, uh, thank you again. Uh, this is uh, terrific that there are so many people focused on working on uh, electronic quality measures. Um, I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to just run through a few thoughts. Um, apologize for no slides. A little background on that. Uh, in the government, anytime you do slides, they have to be approved by all the people all the way up the organization. And since I've been changing from ONC to CMS, it was never clear which organization would actually have to approve my slides, so it was much easier just not to have them. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, first, uh, a little bit about why we measure. I kind of talked about this yesterday, but for any of you that weren't here, I think it's important to realize that we're measuring for multiple reasons. Um, and the, the reasons include um, accountability, which is I think what a lot of people uh, think about. I'm being held accountable for something. But, but that um, is not our primary motivation. Even within government, that's not our primary motivation. Our primary motivation is to have a much more responsive healthcare system that knows where it's going and gets the feedback around important priority areas to assure that it can improve. So measurement that is done only as a regulatory checkbox, uh, we've missed the boat. Um, the goal is a measurement system a nationwide measurement system, but a local measurement system within an office, within a practice, within a community that lets you know that you're making progress, lets you know that, that hypertension's getting better. Hypertension's getting better for your patients, hypertension's getting better in your town, hypertension's getting better in your state. So um, it also ideally should give visibility not just to the practice, but to other people that might care about how the practice is doing, like its patients, like the payers. Uh, in some parts of the country, it's the, um, the employers. Walmart, quite interestingly, now sends all of their um, hip and knee surgeries uh, all across the country, no, all their back surgeries all across the country to Seattle. And the reason they do that is because there's a hospital in Seattle that has such great quality measures and such great cost measures that they're guaranteeing the cost and outcomes of back surgery. So Walmart said, hey, we're going to now use you because you are a guaranteed back surgery option for us. We're hoping that eventually a marketplace like this happens and people are starting to make choices about where and how they get their care because they're they're convinced that the care is of high quality. Um, additionally, uh, it should give us ability to um, use that information for other purposes, like making decisions. Uh, I'll get a little bit more to that, that uh, later on. Um, so then why electronic measurement? We've been doing measurement for a long time. What's wrong with how we've been doing it? Well, you saw the burden um, that's up there. Uh, most of us that have built measurement systems in organizations know that the paper-based measurement, or what's even worse, what I used to watch in my health system, I, I was the CMIO of a hospital and uh, outpatient practice, um, integrated delivery network, and I would go watch some of our measure people, and they would read our electronic health record, and then they would have another computer next to them with a portal for that measurement system, and they would be typing all day long from our electronic health record directly typing into this other portal system that their measurement uh, system was associated with. And I would bet if many of you would go back to your organizations, you would find a lot of that same kind of work. So we know it's expensive right now to either find the paper, track down the paper, uh, and then send that data either electronically or by paper. Um, we also know that that leads to um, uh, errors in transcription and it leads to cost and um, it, it also makes it not very timely. So then why um, move to clinical electronic health record data? Uh, so first of all, claims. Like what's wrong with claims? We've got them, well, let's keep using claims. Claims are really good information. Um, However, uh, an interesting conversation I had behind the scenes with a great big health system that um, was talking about how hard it was to do electronic quality measures. This is four years ago now. And I said, well, you know, I, I realize it's taken you a long time to do this out of your EHR. How long did it take you to get your HEDIS measures right in your health system? Oh, it took us 10 years before we thought that data was good. And so we have to remember back that when we started doing quality measurement based on our claims, our 
people did a lot of adaptation and work to make sure that we were capturing all the claims right. How many of you have tried to capture HEDIS claims for um, foot exams? A nightmare, because you don't get billed for it, so nobody's motivated to actually put it in, and so there's this goofy thing that was invented called a G-code, and then you gotta try to convince all the doctors to put a G-code in the system when they've done a foot exam. It doesn't work, they hate it. Um, and the actual national rates show that probably less than 5% of the time when a foot exam was done is there actually a G-code in the system that designates that it's there. So the claim system was never meant to measure quality. It was, it is a system that we have, it's a good system, but it was meant to pay a bill. And trying to use it to see what the clinical quality is is always going to be hard. Um, it also doesn't have any results. And to the, some of the discussion here today, one of its big problems is lag. Now I think that we could fix that collectively if we had the will. I'm not sure that we do though. Um, what happens with claims is in many places they actually get applied after the clinical visit is done. The, the codes do. And then people want to make, because the bill is attached, they want to do all this extra work to double check it. And, they, they, that, um, uh, and then it goes back and forth between the payer and the provider and all this double checking and back and forth. So uh, what people really want to use for quality measurement is what they call clean claims. Um, but that can take anywhere from a month to six months sometimes to do all this adjudication and cleanup and negotiation about what the claim actually is. And most places won't let you actually start doing quality measurement on the claims data until it's fully adjudicated, until it's fully clean. One of the troubles there is that as a provider, you don't actually know then what actually, w w is this patient gonna really fall into that measure or not until all these other people you're not paying attention to have decided, was this visit really about diabetes or not? Because um, that's what's gonna determine whether this patient gets counted as the diabetes patient for the diabetes measure because they're busy adjudicating and going back and forth between the billing and the other people. So providers need a way to say, I know which patient's a diabetic. And I know that if I act on this diabetic patient, that's actually gonna impact my scores downstream. And they, it's hard to depend on this cleanup adjudication process afterwards. It also doesn't have any results. So if I, if I want to know what was the blood pressure, that's not in the claim. What was the lab test result, the hemoglobin A1C or the, uh, any other test result, it's not there. So how about if we use ADT? You guys are IT people. ADT are the feeds we get from hospitals that tell us admission, discharge, and transfer. You know, who was admitted to the hospital, how were they discharged, where were they transferred? This is pretty standard data happening for 30 plus years across the country. It's now getting pooled together. This actually might help for some um, uh, quality measurement. However, much like claims, it doesn't have the clinical diagnosis, the clinical results, the clinical things we need. So um, then what about EHR data? Well, uh, EHR data, uh, which is what I believe in, which is why I had my job at ONC uh, doing clinical quality measurement and policy around EHR data. But I started that work back at my health system and we, we had lots of great um, visibility and ability to change our practice because of the data we could extract from our EHR, because of the kind of decisions we could make. So one of those things, um, which sounds pretty straightforward, it took us a year to figure out. We uh, were a system of almost 500 doctors with 40 clinics and a million patients a year. We had no idea if our specialists were actually timely in seeing the patients and getting back to primary care. So we said, hey, let's incentivize our specialists and make sure they're actually closing the loop and seeing their patients, seeing our patients and following up. We, um, all of it was electronic and uh, it, we realized we had tolerated incredible variation by our specialists. They didn't even know how good they were or bad they were. They all thought they were good at this. And when we actually could get the data out of our EHR about how uh, timely were they really at getting back to, to the people that referred patients to them, um, it was a huge wake-up call for everybody. And we put lots of processes in place and a lot of support for these specialists to really make sure that we were getting timely information back to those people that referred to them. This was uh, a breakthrough for us. Improved relationships, improved patient care, improved communication, and it was only made possible because we could use EHR data to make that happen. 
Um, the other thing that if you've played around some with the standards that we'll kind of talk about a little later today, the difference between ICD-9, um, which is used for billing, and SNOMED, which we use uh, in meaningful use and for clinical uh, information, is actually a, a big difference. ICD-9 is what's called a categorical, which means it's designed to put people into great big buckets of like things. What it doesn't do is have much nuance. In ICD-9, there are only a few names for diabetes. There are only a few names for different diseases. And it drives doctors kind of crazy because we have a whole range of ways we describe these people. And ICD-9 makes them bucket them all together in one thing. ICD-9 is trying to drive out uncertainty and force you into making a more certain choice than you have. It has a few thousand codes. Uh, SNOMED, which is the very descriptive language, it's designed to describe all the range and variation, um, has six million codes. And it's designed to fully be able to express the, all that clinical difference. But it also is built so that it will, um, the way it's, it works, it, it's built in a hierarchy so you can lump and group it. So then why electronic quality measures? Well, we, you heard a little bit about it here. Um, one of the key reasons are these standards, that if everybody who wants your measures is asking for them in a different way, you have to reprogram your system and sometimes manually reprogram your system or have a human being rerun your data all the time and then reformat it to all these different formats. And that is, if we could free those people up from doing that work, they could do a lot more important work in improving care, in supporting practices, in actually building tools to get care better. So there's no really particularly good reason why we have all those formats. We just have never committed and said, let's just have one. So we're, the government has said, let's commit, let's have one format, one way to do this. We know it's gonna be hard, but we, let's pick a format that's, that, that fits the purpose. So there's a format, and I think Dr. Kendrick will get into some of this, but there's a format to express the measure. And one of the reasons that that has, one of the big ahas for me when I got to government is that when we express measures using this electronic format, um, it has a number of benefits. One of them is that the way we have expressed measures in the past has been paragraph and narrative. Because we've designed it for these people that are sitting reading a chart and then doing this, and they have a lot of human judgment. And so we've never actually resolved some ambiguous parts of the measure. One of my favorite ones was a measure of, are you on the right um, HIV medicines? And it had a whole section that said, look at the guideline, which was a 60-page guideline about the right HIV medicines. And the 60-page guideline says, well, if you've tried all these other medicines, and if they didn't tolerate them, and if there's a really good clinical reason, it's okay to use these, but otherwise it's not okay to use them. And that was the, that was the specification. And we were trying to figure out how do we electronically specify that, and we couldn't. It's impossible because we never actually did the hard work of saying what is right and what isn't. Part of this electronic specification forces us into this really clear, consistent way that we're expressing these measures and getting rid of that ambiguity. Um, with this common format, then there can be a whole commercial industry around this. Now all of a sudden it's not custom people doing custom reports everywhere. Uh, you can actually build uh, tools, apps, plugins, et cetera, to help you make this happen. You can also automate things. That's what Skimmer was showing you. You can test them. That's what I was responsible for at ONC, is certifying that software vendors could actually use these formats and we could test them. And even more importantly, once they're tested, there's an accountability process. So we know that people aren't always able to do what they said they were tested for, but because they've been tested and certified and there's accountability around their certification, you can now complain to ONC and say, hey, these guys are supposed to be able to do this. You're, they were tested and certified and now there's an accountability. Um, and finally, I think one of the most important and interesting ways, reasons to do this is then we um, take a lot of the work out of the sourcing and um, formatting and we can apply it into the use. We can actually build cool tools and cool views um, to make this work better. Things like apps, alerts, care gaps, reports, et cetera. How many of you guys use Google Maps? I use Google Maps all the time. 
I love Google Maps. Would you use Google Maps if the data was three months old? Would you use Google Maps if the data was a year old? Um, what Google Maps does is take data picked for a different reason and helps me make decisions about where I drive today. And it integrates data from lots of different places because that data is in a standard format and it shows it to me in a way that I can make really good choices. My vision for what this quality data can be eventually is what if that was a Google map for your healthcare experience? What if as a patient, this data was available to me and I could say, you know, I think I'm probably, I'm having back pain and it looks like I could go to the ER or I could go to this hospital or I could go to this primary care doctor. What is my pathway gonna look like on those, from the experiences that other people had? How long is it gonna take? Uh, what are my outcomes going to likely be? Oh, gee, you know, I tried that one, I'm going to switch, and Google Maps lets me switch instantly, and I instantly it recalculates and I can see, and I can see in real time what my weight might be. So if we get this right, we will have the same kind of data available, hopefully in real time like that, that people that can, like you guys, can build cool tools for us to make good choices, patients to make good choices, and doctors to make good choices. Um, I think that's as much time as you wanted me to take. Um, uh, I'll be around all day and happy to take any questions if people have. Thanks, Kevin. Um, can, you, uh, can you comment about sort of where you see the QRDA standard itself kind of heading a little bit, just, just in terms of its own evolution, because it, I mean, it's a relatively new standard, isn't yeah. it? So a, a little bit of background, I know David's gonna get into this, but the quality reporting data architecture standard is the standard um, to send the quality data of, a, of an electronic quality measure. So there's one standard to ha for how you um, express a measure, and then another standard for how you share the data. And um, it's, it's an XML standard. Um, I think of the, them a bit like a Mad Lib. If any of you played Mad Libs, I'm probably dating myself. But um, a Mad Lib says, put a noun here, put an adjective here, put a verb here. Um, that's kind of what these standards do for a quality measure. Put a denominator here, put a numerator here, put a, put a hemoglobin A1C result there. Um, and that makes it harder to do because someone's got to go to all that work and make sure the A1C always lands in the A1C spot and they have to make sure that the first name always lands in the first name spot. Um, and so people complain, oh my God, these are so hard to use. Well, they're hard to use because the data has been kind of a mess and um, no one has actually been working to put the data in all of those very discrete chunks. So if you actually do the work and get all the data in those chunks, that makes them way easier to use in the end. CMS is committed to QRDA. We've been really clear through Meaningful Use Stage 2, Meaningful Use Stage 3, continue to be clear and uh, broad. We are continuing to build and use QRDA as the CMS standard. Um, <clears throat> so, that means I think there's a future for QRDA. Um, CMS uh, is a, a big customer and driver of quality reporting and of the quality reporting um, standards that are used. Um, one of the things we would love your input and feedback about is QRDA is undergoing rapid evolution um, uh, because it was a brand new standard when it was used in, in Meaningful Use Stage 2. Um, and so we've been focused and working really hard at making it better and better and better and more mature. And we hear two things from groups like you. Gee, this is immature. I wish we had a more mature standard. And please don't change too fast on me. I've been working so hard to make this standard work. I'm not ready for a new one. And so we're um, constantly in listening mode to try to figure out which of those two pathways is the right pathway. Um, stay with one that is not perfect, but the one we've committed to and we're using, or move to the next version of it because we've been spending so much time collectively as a community improving it. And um, it's, we're working very hard to integrate it into FHIR. So there's a FHIR 
group over here. The goal is that QRDA can remain largely unchanged even if we switch to a new way to express measures in fire. Um, but with any of those things, there are always going to be some amounts of, of adaptation because um, that, that's just the way things work. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Dr. Larson. I'm uh, Dr. Tom Stevenson with uh, MyHen. Uh, just a quick question. As a uh, uh, provider, you know, listening to you and to Bo earlier talking about, you know, this has been pr very process-oriented at this point, and, and very similarly to what we've done with uh, EHRs and meaningful use and that sort of thing. And I know across the, uh, uh, the spectrum of physicians, there's been some frustration with this, and that it really is process-oriented. It's really trying to make doctors do things that they normally haven't done in the past, workflow change, but really haven't seen a whole lot from the standpoint of outcomes. And it's like, here I'm doing all this work, what is it really doing to improve my patient's situation? So here I'm doing all this work, and what's the, what's the benefit from it? Can you talk about what it is that we should be communicating to physicians about how this is all uh, taking place, and what's the, the long-term uh, outlook on this? That, that's a hard one, um, and, but thank you for it. Uh, so a, a couple of thoughts about it. So when I ran a measurement program at a health system, uh, this is in 2012. Uh, so about 2011, we stood up our own measurement committee within our health system, and we actually did an inventory, and we were tracking 1,500 quality measures in 2011 in my health system. And we actually were tracking seven different mammography measures. And some of them actually conflicted. They, they had different requirements for, yes, women under 40 have uh, women between 40 and 50 have to have a mammogram, or no women under 40 shouldn't have a mammogram. They were actually, we had both of those measures regulated that we had to be measuring. <clears throat> we said stop the madness, and we decided internally to pick our own measures for improvement. We said we believe in mammograms. We're going to build a mammogram program for us and know what we want and need to do to improve mammography screening rates. <clears throat> and then, as a system, we'll report to everybody else. Um, we're confident that if we get a program that's really good at getting the right women mammograms, the other stuff will, will just naturally happen, and it was true. That not, we didn't spend time um, with our clinicians trying to explain to them the differences between all these different people that wanted different mammogram scores. We just said, here's our mammogram improvement program, here's how you're doing on our internal mammogram improvement, and, and we believe that women need mammograms. Um, so in a big health system, that's more possible because you have more of that infrastructure. I think that within a smaller practice, you can do some of the same things by just picking the ones you're gonna focus on improvement and figuring out how the rest of them are a reporting activity, but the improvement activity is yours and it's something you believe in, it's something you track, and something you follow. Um, uh, as far as the outcomes go, an aha that I had, again, this was in doing uh, early quality measurement, we were one of the pilot places. There, there's a much maligned meaningful use measure that I actually really love, which is um, preventable um, hospital uh, blood clots. And the reason it's so maligned, the reason people hate it, because hospitals don't track blood clots. They don't actually know if a patient had a blood clot. So the complaints we get all the time from hospitals are, how, oh my God, how are we gonna do this? We don't know who has a blood clot. You're making us figure out who has a blood clot. And we're like, yes, that is an outcome. <laughs> um, it turns out we don't usually track outcomes. We usually track process things, and we usually write down process things, and we have not systematically committed ourselves as an industry to tracking outcomes. Now, we all say we want that, and we all tell Congress we want that, but when it really comes home to roost in our own practice, that's new work. That's somebody making phone calls to say, did you get a blood clot after you left here? That's somebody making sure the chart says, this patient did or did not have a blood clot. Um, so totally agree with you. I love outcomes and want us to get to outcomes, but we also need to be honest with ourselves. Outcomes are gonna be more work. Outcomes are gonna be new data. Outcomes are going to be new contacts with patients to understand did they really have this thing happen to them or not. Another question, yeah. Um, Dr. Kendrick spoke earlier in the week about the importance and value of uh, patient-centric 
uh, quality anal 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 <laughs> analysis. And um, today, Michigan's immunization registry is a certified registry, and so someone could uh, you query for the immunization history, and maybe there was an immunization measure that someone got immunized other than at your uh, practice, and you could still, that patient would fall in the numerator. So my question is, um, is it possible today, or do you see a future near where we could have a, a community registry of all quality type data so that uh, we could get a better picture of how the patient's care was at a larger level instead of just reporting for meaningful use credit for a specific provider or a specific EHR? The answer is yes, and the answer is it's up to you guys. Um, the people in this room are the ones that would make that happen. And the work to make it happen is figuring out how to trust each other and what the business model is for sharing. There are examples, Dr. Kendricks is a key one. There's also examples in Maine and Vermont. Um, Maryland is busy standing up the same thing. Um, uh, with uh, Wisconsin did this 15 years ago, believe it or not. Um, uh, so there are examples across the country where, where, it's, where it has happened the hard work to make it happen is figuring out how you're willing to share, how you're willing to do consent, and who is going to pay to have all that happening in the middle. Um, I totally believe in it. I think it's the right thing. I think it's the right thing for lots of reasons. If we're ever going to decrease duplication, um, we're going to do a much better job of decreasing duplication if we get a really good holistic view of what's happening with somebody. Um, also, that's what patients expect of us. They expect that we have a holistic view. We, we did some focus grouping with our patients. We were building a new ACO, and we were doing it with Medicaid patients. And we said, um, you, are you OK if we share data between the hospital and the homeless shelter and the behavioral health clinic? And they said, you mean you haven't been doing that already? We, that's what we thought you did. That's what we thought we were getting care for you about. Um, and so, uh, yes, the, and there are models for how to do it, um, but it's up to you guys to figure out how to trust each other and how to get your organizations to trust each other and how to finance it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ellen Bunting. I'm with the Michigan Data Collaborative. Um, we work to build um, a database in support of the MAPCP project in Michigan is called MyPICT. So we currently have a database of um, more than 4 million covered lives in Michigan. And we are combining claims and EHR data right now. And that, I think, is what you were answering in part to the former question is, if you have all payers in the same area and you're also able to bring in the EHR data, you do have the whole for as many payers who are participating, you have a holistic um, vision. And an all payers claims database can do that if you're able to also integrate the clinical data. So I did want to give a plug for that model because currently when we do that, together the impact of an EHR on the rate is about 2 to 3 percent. So you're already getting a very high um, rate of uh, uh, compliance just with claims and the EHR brings you up about two or three percent. But what you're talking about more is the um, bringing in data that is more current. And I understand uh, the electronic clinical data will be able to give people better gaps in care. So um, my question is, when do you see us, I mean, the vision that you've laid out, when do you actually see that happening, where we're really moving away from claims-based measurement and toward electronic clinical measurement for um, all of these domains? Um, again, that's going to be up to you. Um, I would say you're going to move forward when um, your payers trust it, and uh, because most of this activity is still being driven by the payers. And so the payers are going to have to, right now, um, 
in healthcare, we live in a world where we feel like we have to have all the data to validate things ourselves, and it's every one of us in the system. So we're all saying, I don't trust somebody in the middle. I need all the data so I can do all the analysis, so I can make sure that this thing is true. Um, we're in a place where there's too much data, and there's no way all of us can have all the data. So we've got to figure out who are the in-between people that will have data that we trust. And so that organization has to be trustable, that, that, that should be transparent, the people that have it have to be trustable. Uh, and then we have to all be willing to give up some of our, our own control into this middle place that's trustable. Um, I come from a state, Minnesota, that, that we did that um, 15 years ago or so for quality reporting. Uh, it's called the Minnesota Community Measurement Program, and all the payers uh, use those results to pay for all of their um, value-based payment incentives. So we reported one time, uh, we didn't use electronic reporting, actually, we used a different kind of reporting, but we reported one time to one state, well, it wasn't even state, it was a kind of public-private consortium that has its own governance board, and they were the neutral third party that said, this is your score. And that was the score Blue Cross got, it's the score that um, all the health plans got in the state, uh, and it, it, it's the neutral third party. It works, uh, but again, it's about building this neutral third party of trust. Uh, one thing I would um, add a gentle correction to with your, if you get all payer claims data, you can calculate HEDIS measures, and you would only get a little bit of change with um, adding EHR data. Remember though, HEDIS measures were designed to say what quality can we infer if only all we have is claims. So, um, of course you're gonna look good with claims measures because you have claims data. Uh, I think it's important to wrap your head around the fact that HEDIS was, a, to my mind, a, a, a step on the path, but it's not the end goal because it is not very robust. It's quite limited and constrained in what it can actually tell us. It doesn't tell us outcomes. It doesn't tell us test results. It doesn't tell us a lot of things that we care about um, as, as people seeking healthcare. It tells us, did I have a blood test? Did I have a mammogram? It didn't tell me if my mammogram was of high quality. It didn't tell me if they did the right follow-up for my mammogram. It didn't tell me lots of things I would care about if I was someone seeking a mammogram. Um, so uh, you got, it's in your power. You guys just have to figure out what it would be in Michigan and how that would work. There's actually a, a consortium. Uh, Dr. Kendrick's organization is part of this, but there's a national consortium of these measurement collaboratories called ENRI, the National Regional Health Improvement the Network of uh, the Network of Regional Health Improvement. N R H I. I always get the H and R turned around. Uh, but there are 33 of these across the country of all different shapes and sizes and different ways of work in many, many states in the country. Uh, but, but, it, but you'd have to figure out the right one for Michigan. Another quick question, if you don't mind. Um, so this has to, has to do with, with all the different measures that are out there. So, you know, Bo went into some detail about this and you alluded to it as well. There's a lot of variation in the, in the quality measures out there, the different reporting systems that we have to report to, and, and again, of course, even payers, you know, have specific ones and all. So, in, in a great example, no longer relevant, but was LDLs, you know, and, you know, whether you had to report at 130 or 100 or 70, you know, there was this wide vari variation, and the registries really can't deal with that. So you had to really pick the lowest common denominator and, and try to go towards that even though it maybe is going against really what best clinical judgment is. So with that being said, um, from your position and looking into your crystal ball, what, what do you see happening over the next few years in, in, in this reconciliation of the different measures um, to kind of bring this burden down on the physicians? Yeah, the, so I, uh, I think of measure burden and measure alignment in two domains, and I may be a little heretical here, one of the domains is when there's waste, when there's unnecessary uh, look-alike, sound-alike measures, and those unnecessary look-alike, sound-alikes are because I needed to tweak it. I didn't quite trust somebody else's version, the docs in my practice don't really like this, in this state we don't really do it that way, um, I don't really quite have that data, 
Um, there's actually a great analysis that was done um, around this that showed um, almost no consistency of measures, definitions. Uh, it was um, uh, really startling. So that's, I think, our big work, is to get rid of the look-alike, sound-alike measures and align on a core set of measures and deeply align what we call micro-alignment, um, uh, which is a sort of new term I think we came up with in Washington, whether it is meaningful or not to you. But it, it's kind of to what, what Bo was talking about, how can the specifications be really aligned top to bottom all the way through the specification? So the measurement period's the same, the denominator's the same, the exclusions are the same, lots and lots of things are the same so that we, um, on the same population with the same provider, get the same measure result, regardless of who the customer is. Uh, that is hard work and I think that's the right work for us to do and we're launching some of that work in Washington but some of it will need help from groups like you because what we find is as states try to do this themselves, in order to get buy-in, they say, oh, we, we need to kind of adapt it for us because our people won't trust it unless it's adapted for us. And then that becomes one more version. The heretical part of this is I think we don't have enough measures. And the reason I think we don't have enough measures is because the US healthcare system is huge and complicated. And to think that we're gonna measure how good the healthcare system is with three measures, I think is, is a little crazy making. Um, and if you talk to any specialists or people with um, non-common diseases, they don't have to even be a rare disease, but if I've got a friend with lupus, I think she deserves good quality measures for her lupus control. How many of these measure sets contain good measures for lupus? I've got another good friend with sickle cell anemia. Where are there good measures for sickle cell disease? I don't see them. So um, uh, I think we're gonna need to commit to a measure infrastructure, and we're gonna to need to align where we can, and then we're gonna to need to be open. Uh, that's why I like automation. The more we can automate this, the more uh, the burden goes away, uh, and we're not focused on alignment as the only way to reduce burden, we're focusing on automation as a way to reduce burden. Dr. Kendrick. Uh, Kevin, thanks for your great remarks, and I'm probably gonna echo most of them. But the uh, one question that, that I find providers struggle a lot with is, you know, we're also scientists and we're trained to read the literature and look for the red asterisk that tells us that something is significant. How do we bring that level of rigor into the quality measurement space and avoid judging provider performance based on what could really be random events? It, that's a really hard one and I'll, we don't talk about it enough. There's a really nice article, I think it was in JAMA or New England Journal uh, about three or four years ago that showed in those PQRS measures that we have, um, if you look uh, in just diabetes measures, which is a pretty, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of diabetics, and in one uh, provider's practice with diabetics, uh, looking at those measures, uh, most primary care providers actually don't have enough patients that they see in a year to be a statistically significant difference in their outcome versus another provider. Um, so uh, that, we have to name it and own it, and describe that. Um, I think that there are a couple ways around it. Uh, one that I'm seeing a lot of, this is happening not just in measurement, but more importantly in healthcare, is move to teams and move to groups. So when we're trying to measure accountability by one single doctor, it's a sort of false accountability. Um, that one doctor isn't responsible for all that care. There's a whole team of people. Well, even if that doctor's in solo practice, there's a group of nurses and pharmacists and specialists and hospitals and lots of people that are jointly making sure that that, that care has happened to that person. And so um, by moving to more group and team reporting, we're gonna make the statistical significance uh, much more uh, robust and scientifically uh, sound. Um, I think the other path, if we want and need to continue down the single person accountability path, is to move to measures that are less disease focused and more kind of holistically focused. Um, we don't have very many of these, but like this closing referral loop is one kind of example. It's a process measure, but I would argue that's a process I really care about. What if you had a measure of wait times? What if you had a measure of how fast my doctor responds to my phone calls? Those are the things I would actually like as a patient um, and they would quickly become statistically significant because I actually do enough of those things um, 
across any kind of patients that I see that they would stay consistent. Um, uh, but in the drive to outcomes, I, I think that the types of outcomes we may eventually get to, although they're really in the developmental stage, are um, functional outcomes. What, what if, you know, my, what's my ideal measure? My ideal measure is a shared decision-making measure of what are my goals as a patient about my function and my life. And we measure that and set that at the beginning of my treatment period. And then we measure my care team's ability to meet my goals and keep me from um, sliding down uh, or uh, uh, not doing more than I wanted. That's a really hard measure to get to, but it could be a consistent measure that we would do everywhere with everybody, especially people with chronic disease, because it's a measure of um, what I really care about, which is my goals and my function, as opposed to saying, what I care about is my A1C. I don't really care about my A1C. I care what, how my A1C impacts my life. I care about if I feel sick or well. Those are the things I care about. Another one of my favorites, I'll just, uh, since I've been thinking about this a long time, there's a researcher um, named uh, Victor Montori at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester who does work on, on um, treatment burden. I would love us to build measures of which providers get good outcomes with least amount of monkey business. And so if I've got two options for my breast cancer therapy, and option A has me coming into the doctor every week for three blood tests at different days and different scans and different other things, and Dr. B has figured out how to do that once a month with a minimum amount of monkey business for me, and I have the same outcome and even the same cost, wouldn't I love to know which of those two routes for me in a kind of Google Maps way has the lowest amount of burden in monkey business in my path. Um, we've got the data to do that, we just have to start experimenting and figuring out where are the right places to do that measurement. 